Okay, hi everybody. Yes, I apologize that we have these on off, uh, but uh, thank you for keeping up. <laughs> and if you didn't keep up, then you can always watch it later on YouTube. No, You're in. in, excellent. In. Okay, excellent. Everybody mute yourselves and we will get started. So in our uh, series on Jerusalem, we have reached our fourth session. We're going to talk about the Muslim quarter today, uh, a little bit outside, mostly inside. Um, and uh, we're going to talk not only about Muslims in the Muslim quarter, but as we're going to see, we're going to talk about the north of the city in different time periods, the north of the old city, of course. Um, and it's different than the other quarters in an interesting way, right? Uh, if each quarter, Jews, Christian, Jewish, Christian, Armenian, essentially has always had that population in it ever since that population came to the city, right? The Jewish quarter is the oldest part uh, of the city within the walls and Jews moved there already in first temple times. The Christian quarter since Christianity became an established religion and they started to really have property in Jerusalem, it's always been Christian. And even in times of Muslim control, the Christian quarter has stayed under Christian control. And the same thing with the Armenians and even more so because they don't allow in outsiders. The Muslim quarter is different. Um, there are many Muslim residences, of course, and it's very important that it's proximate to, to the Temple Mount, uh, to the Dome of the Rock, to Al-Aqsa. That's a very big deal for the Muslim residents, but we're going to see that there are Christian churches, very important Christian churches and Christian sites in the Muslim quarter, including the Via Dolorosa of today. There was Jewish settlement here, both in medieval times and in more modern times. Uh, and, and it's a little bit of a chameleon-like quarter. It, it's changed over time. As we're going to see, it's the largest quarter, certainly today. Um, and it happens to have a lot of open space that's been used for various uh, purposes throughout history. So a Muslim quarter is uh, because of the large number of Muslim residents there, but it's not complete the complete and whole truth. Uh, and that's what we're going to see as we go along. Of course, what you're looking at here, this beautiful picture is of Shar Shem or Damascus Gate or Nablus Gate or Bab al -Amud. It's got a lot of different names. We're going to discuss it more. Uh, the Definitely the most beautiful gate uh, of all the gates. Uh, and one of the two primary entrances into the old city, Jaffa Gate being the other one. Uh, but this is definitely one of the major ones and, and hence its uh, decorations, its embellishments. It's so beautiful. But we'll come back to Damascus Gate. Let's start with a little bit of type of topography. Okay? Topography is destiny, as we have said many times. It's very, very important. Uh, and it's important here as well. If the city uh, of Jerusalem, right, uh, has a very important and deep valley on the east side, the Kidron Valley. It has another important deep valley on the south, curving around to the west, the Hinnom Valley. In the north, there is no valley. Okay, there is no valley. There are smaller valleys that go. We have the Teropian Valley, right, that goes over here, but there is no valley that is going from east to west in the north of the city. And that is very significant because it means it's the only side of the city that does not have topographical protection, right? Somebody wants to come and attack the city. They're not having the disadvantage of coming up from the valley. They're actually coming from the high point, right? They have the advantage of height. Uh, and that's why historically attacking the city has been from the north, right? We hear about this in Tanakh. Uh, we certainly know about it from the Assyrians, from the Babylonians. Jeremiah says, Mitzafon the evil will come from the north. So the north is the most vulnerable uh, part of the city because of that Herod is going to build in the first century before the common era, he's gonna build the Antonia Fortress right over here to protect the Temple Mount. Doesn't actually work, but it's important. However, we do have a valley that goes north-south right over here. This is called the Beit Zeta Valley, right? You see it over here and over here, okay? And this is important. It's uh, It feeds into the Kidron, okay? 
but it's important because it's a way to collect water. And we're going to see that water collection and pools is an important part of this part of the city before it becomes incorporated within the city walls and even afterwards. Okay, so that's something that's very important to understand. Uh, one last thing about topography, right? We're on more or less the same height as the Temple Mount, right? And if you've ever walked along the Via Dolorosa or if you've gone to see the view from one of the buildings here, you can see that you are almost on the height of the Temple Mount. You're a little bit lower, but you're almost there. Um, and that proximity, um, and this is part of what the Mamluks do, that they build up the city, they build arches and they build their streets along arches. If you've ever gone to the Kotel tunnels, you've seen that, so that they can become close they can be on the level of the Temple Mount. Okay, but that's a, a different story, but still interesting to talk about. Okay, uh, where are we? Where are we going? Okay, so the Muslim Quarter, as you can see it uh, in the small map down here, right? We are in the northeastern part of the city, just to remind us, right? We have uh, our different sections, right? Just to review, we've already talked about the Christian Quarter, over here, the Armenian quarter over here, the Jewish quarter, and the Temple Mount itself. But this green is the Muslim quarter. Okay, uh, what are we going to be looking at today? We're going to be looking at Damascus Gate, Jarshem, etc., etc. We're going to come around to Lions Gate. We'll talk a little bit about what you can see if you walk along on the top from there. Okay, and then we're going to really walk along what's known as the Via Dolorosa. Okay, now we're going to see a few important things here. This square, which today is a parking lot, was a major pool in Second Temple times. This area of uh, St. Anne's Church and the Bethesda pools, also major water. Okay, um, the area of the Franciscans and the beginning of the Via Dolorosa, um, the Ecce Homo Arch and the story of Hadrian. Right, all of these things are going to be important in our story. The Struthium pool underneath uh, by the Kotel tunnels. Hey, okay? all of these are places that we're going to talk about. Just one other uh, important thing to notice if you ever walked in the old city, so you know this a little bit. When you come in from Shar Shrem, you go down a street that is called Rehov Hagai in Hebrew, or in Arabic, it's called El Wad, same meaning, the valley street. Okay, this is eventually going to take you to the Western Wall, to the Kotel over here, okay? The corner of the Via Dolorosa and of Rehov Hagai, right, is right over here, major building called the Austrian Hospice. We're gonna talk about that too, right? Um, and this is another way into the Cardo, okay? The Cardo, which is the main street in the time of Byzantines and later. Okay, so just to keep us a little bit clear about where we're going. All right, let's move on. Timeline so that we don't get too confused. Um, city, th this area of the city changes throughout history, right? In first temple times, we are outside the city. This is not included in the city of Bayt Rishon, okay? That doesn't mean it's not important to the city of Bayat Rishon, right? The city needs things on the outside, right? You need water supply. Some of that's going to be inside the city, but some of that's going to be out. So we're going to talk about a pool that's right outside, uh, the Brecha Eliona, the upper pool. There are graves from the end of First Temple times that are outside, that are you can see some that are on Derek Shrem outside of today's old city, but there undoubtedly are some inside of today's old city as well. Much harder to excavate. Okay, so that's in first temple times. This is outside the city. When we get into second temple times, the beginning of second temple times, it's still outside the city. Okay, uh, Hasmonean times, again, we're using this for water. Herod times, we're using this for water, right? So Her Hasmonean, second century before the common era, Herod first century before the common era, he adds to the idea of water sources, he also builds this fortress of the Antonia, but we're still outside the city. When does this area become part of the city? Only at the very end of Second Temple times, first century of the common era, a few decades before the temple is destroyed and Jerusalem is captured by the Romans, uh, there's the third wall that's built and the city becomes very, very big. And this area, 
as well as areas that are not inside the old city of today, becomes part of Jerusalem. Okay? Roman period, the city changes ownership, changes names. It's called Elia Capitolina, and the Romans redo this area yet again. Okay, They don't rebuild the walls that they destroyed in the Great Revolt, but they do build a large, important arch, triumphal arch, which Damascus Gate in Arabic is still named after Bab el Amud, the gate of the of the pillar that stood there at the arch. We'll see that in a few minutes. Uh, they build a forum, a marketplace, uh, and they build a main street. By the Byzantine period, this is a very important site. Okay, there's a big church that we're going to talk about by the Bethesda pools. We have the beginnings of this route of the Via Dolorosa, although it's not the same as it is today. Okay, we'll come back to that. Muslim period, the early Muslim period, right, the beginning when the Muslims first come to Jerusalem, 7th century, the 8th century, 9th, 10th century, okay, uh, by the 11th century, the kind of the end of this early Muslim period, the Jews are living in this area, okay, which is interesting, we don't usually think of the Jews, uh, not in the part of the Muslim quarter that they're going to live in in the 20th century, but even further in, we'll see where in a few minutes. Uh, all of this, the Muslim building, the Jewish building is all destroyed by the Crusaders. The Crusaders, right, when they come, 1099, they expel the Muslims and the Jews. Mamluks come in the 13th century and they they conquer the Crusaders and they throw out the Christians, right? Back and forth, back and forth. This is the story of Jerusalem. This is the story of the land of Israel. Hey, um, but in the late Ottoman period, in the 19th century, the Ottomans start to allow the Christians to come back to rebuild some of their churches, and the Jews start to come back as well. Okay, so that's like we said, it's uh, it's a it's a quarter that changes its identity many times over. Um, so let's start with Shar Shem with Damascus Gate, right? Um, so first of all, all these names, right? In Hebrew, it's called the Gate of Shechem. In English, it's called Damascus Gate. The Arabs call it Bab al Amud, but they also call it the Nablus Gate, which also means Shechem, right? What do Shechem and Damascus have in common? They are north of the city, right? The city's the gate is named after its ultimate destination, right? Joppa Gate faces to the west, so it's named after Joppa. Damascus Gate faces to the north, so it's named after cities to the north, okay? Um, the pictures that you see here, this is a picture on the left. This black and white picture is from the 1930s, I believe, before the large plaza was built. We have a picture of that plaza in our first picture. I don't remember. Mm, a little bit, not really. Okay. Um, but before the plaza was built, but Israel built this large and impressive plaza going down to the gate with steps, right? It's supposed to be like a gathering place. It's an interesting what happened with it. Um, but in the course of doing that, they also did a formal excavation of something that was known already in the 1930s and in the 1960s, but no one had ever really fully excavated it. And that's what you see here in the picture on the right, right? In the picture on the right, on the top here is um the gate of today right this is today's Shar Shem. but just to the left of it is a gate from roman times this gate is 1800 years old okay and today well not today today it's been closed temporarily but it will be reopened again it's an amazing place you can go visit it and it's part of the triumphal arch that the Romans built here after the Bar Kokhba revolt. It's only one piece of it, right? The triumphal arch, let's just erase this for a second. Okay, triumphal arch looks like this, okay? It's, this is what triumphal arches often look like. Not always, sometimes there's just one freestanding one. I have to say, I just came back from Rome. I'd never been and it was uh, unbelievable to see everything there. And you really see, you see the Arch of Titus, you see the Arch of Constantine. It was incredible to see all these things. And then you come back and you see that our, our excavations are kind of measly compared to theirs, but still very cool, right? So those arches, let's say the Arch of Titus is one freestanding arch, but there are arches that are these triple arches that are not connected 
to a wall of a city. They're called triumphal arches, okay? The singular ones as well. And they are meant to celebrate something, someone. And this is uh, this is a triumphal arch that is one of four that have been found in Jerusalem. We're going to see another one a little later on today when we see the Eke Homo Arch. There's another one uh, in the Christian Quarter. And there's another one that's outside of today's old city by the Third Walk. This is erected by the Romans, by Hadrian, by the Emperor Hadrian, okay? Um, you could see, alias Hadrianus, Colonia Elia Capitolina, okay? This is the colony of Elia Capitolina, um, and this is where we get to the Roman city. Now, it's a very interesting question. We're not doing this today, but if you want to talk about the history of the Bar Kokhba revolt, uh, for, for a long time, scholars debated whether uh, making the pagan city of Elia Capitolina is what precipitated the Jews' revolt against the Romans, or it was a consequence of the Jews' revolt against the Romans, right? The Jews revolted, and then the Romans punished them by throwing them out of the city and making the city into a pagan city. Today, we're pretty sure based on coins that have been found that Hadrian founded the city of Elia Capitolina before the revolt, but also created it more pagan as Jews became more rebellious and created more trouble, right? But in any case, the city becomes a pagan city. It gets a new name, Elia Capitolina, uh, and it gets new uh, a new shape, okay? If before, in the time of the temple, right, the main part of the city, right, the focal point of the city, of course, is the Temple Mount and the Beit HaMikdash. The Romans don't care about that, right? They put up some uh, some statues, they put up a pagan temple, but it's not the main thing for them. If the main street of the city in temple times was along what today is the Western Wall area going all the way down to Harab to uh, Ir David, Roman times, there's two reasons why this is no longer the main street. First of all, nobody needs to be here. There's no Jews. Nobody's on the Temple Mount, right? You have this incredible destruction and tragedy. Uh, and, and this is not the important part of the city anymore. That's number one. Number two, sounds silly, but very important. There are no bulldozers in ancient times. And when the Romans come and destroy the temple, they knock down tons and tons, literally tons and tons of stones onto the street here. And they're not going to clear it away. It's, it's an obstruction. So what do they do? They create a new center to the city, okay? And it goes down this street. And this is what we today call the cardo. Sorry about my not straight lines. Okay. Now they make a pagan temple over here. Okay. This is going to become super important when the Roman Empire becomes Christian in Byzantine times. This is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Okay. This is what we talked about when we did the Christian quarter. So this becomes the focal point of the city. This is the important part of the city going down what we think of today as the middle, right, of the city, very close to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Um, but what's fascinating is that the Romans create this gate this, uh, these streets, here's another street with another forum, a marketplace, okay, uh, marketplace over here. These streets and these, these institutions are still the main skeleton, the bones of the city today, which is fascinating. You can come into uh, the gate of Damascus Gate, which is today attached to the walls of the city, but when the Romans built it, it wasn't. And there's this big open plaza here. You may notice it. You may not notice it because there's usually a lot of people selling stuff, but there's a big open plaza here. And then you have the main cardo, right? And then you have the smaller cardo, which we've also found remains of, but it's a street today as well. And all of this is exactly what the Romans created and they stayed in today. The marketplaces are in the same place, okay? The streets are in the same places, uh, and it just shows you how much of an impact the Roman uh, architecture had on the city. Um, okay, let's... Uh, Let's just see. Okay. Um, now we know about this shape of the city 
mostly not from archaeology, although now we have more archaeology, but from a very important map that's called the Medva map. Uh, I think we spoke about it when we spoke about the Cardo. If we didn't here, we'll speak about it here. Okay, this is, uh, this is one section of this map was discovered uh, on the floor of a church in Jordan, a place called Medva in the 19th century. The floor of the church was an enormous mosaic map of the land of Israel. This is in the sixth century. It's an amazing resource because it shows us it's like a photograph of the time. So here's our city of Jerusalem. Now you can see beautifully, right? So perfectly. Here's our cardo with the pillars on both sides. This was discovered by Nachman Avigad in the late 60s, early 70s. He knew he was going to find it because he saw it on the map. Here's our secondary cardo, which today you can also see pieces of the archaeology of it uh, not far from the Kotel, from the Western Wall. Okay, here's our main square as you enter. Here's our gate okay and what's this thing right this thing that's standing up so remember we said the arabs still if you take the light rail in jerusalem right the every stop of the light rail they announce the stop in hebrew and english and in arabic and when you get to shar shrem they say shar shrem damascus gate bab el amud the gate of the pillar why because 1800 years ago the emperor hadrian built a pillar in the gate where he put a huge bust of himself on top of it because everybody should know who's in charge. That pillar, that bust have not been there for centuries upon centuries, but the name stuck. The name is still there, which is fabulous. Okay, so that's what we have here. Um, inside of the Roman gate, of the ancient Roman gate, there are a couple of really interesting things. You can see the original paving stones from the 1800 years ago. And on one of the paving stones, you can see what's down here etched into the stone. You see this in a few places in Jerusalem and other places in Israel, certainly in Rome. Uh, this is a game board, okay? Because soldiers who were on guard duty uh, for hours upon hours, they didn't have phones to play on. Um, what did you do? And they probably didn't read too much either. You etched a game board into the sidewalk. You took a couple of pebbles and you played whatever you played, right? Nine men's Morris or backgammon, Sheshbesh or whatever game you knew, right? And that's what you did to pass the time with your fellow soldiers. Um, Okay, so let's, I'm just looking at these questions because I won't remember later. They repurposed and recycled the stones uh, the Romans were talking about. Yes, probably. In the far northeast corner, there's a temple and medical installations. Let's look back at what you are looking at. Hold on. Close this. Close this. Yes, we're going to get to that. That's Bethesda and, uh, and uh, St. Anne's. Don't worry. We'll get there. Okay, moving on. Um, all right, if we were to walk on the walls of Jerusalem, which we are not going to be doing on Zoom, but we could pretend, okay, if you walk between Damascus Gate and Light, which is a part of the walls, you can walk on the walls almost all, all over the old city, not the part that goes above the Temple Mount, but everything else. Uh, the part between Damascus Gate and Lions Gate was closed for a long time, not for security reasons, but for safety reasons. It needed to be fixed. It was like very potholed. Now it's open, and if you can do it, and you're good at climbing steps and you're in Jerusalem, so worthwhile. It's it's amazing. The views are amazing. Um, so just a couple of things that you see along the way, right? We pass a gate that today is called Herod's Gate or Bab al-Sahara. Hey, why is it called Herod's Gate? Herod built a lot of things because it's near a church that's, uh, that the, uh, the Christians called Herod's Palace. It wasn't Herod's Palace, but that's what the gate is called. Hey, uh, you can see the Rockefeller Museum. You can see Bill building uh, a building that was bought by a Terrakhanim, right? We'll get back to them in the Muslim quarter a little bit later. But you can also see two strange things. One is called the Indian Hospice, okay? This is right inside the walls. And, and in general, when you walk up there, one of the very eye-opening things is that there's a lot of space in the Muslim quarter. It's a lot emptier than what one would imagine when you walk through the streets. There's parks and there's playing fields for schools and there's all kinds of quirky little things. So this is uh, an 800 year old building. There was a Sufi mystic named Bab al-Farid who would come and who came and prayed. Uh, and today this is a place that if you are an Indian Muslim, you can come and you can stay here. I don't know, for free, for cheap. It's an interesting place. Otherwise you can't stay here. So sorry. 
probably most of you do not qualify. Okay, the other thing is if you keep walking, you get to the northeast corner of the city, okay, uh, across from the Rockefeller Museum, and you can see when you're up there, you see it when you're on the bottom as well, that you're in a tower. Okay, um, this tower um, is uh, has the the Muslim name, the Arabic name Burj Al Aklak, the stor stork tower. Okay, um, from across from the old city walls where the Rockefeller Museum is, this is where Godfrey of Bouillon attacks the city of Jerusalem in 1099. Okay, uh, Godfrey of Bouillon's crest was a swan. Uh, the Arabs confused the swan and the stork, and they called it the stork tower. It really should be the, the swan tower, but it's remembering this historic event in 1099, this terrible historic event uh, of Godfrey attacking the city, conquering the city, murdering, massacring all of the Muslims, all of the Jews, the defenders of the city at this part of the city from where the crusaders attack are actually the Jews, right? Because in the in the 11th century, when the Crusaders come, the Jews are the ones who are living in this northeast corner of the city. Not to say that the Muslims are not defending the city, but the Jews are the, the front lines, right? They are right there when the Crusaders attack the city. So that's just a very interesting thing. If you come around, right? Let's just remember where we came around to, okay? We walked from here, oh, sorry walked from the Damascus Gate around, 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 northeast corner up here, down to Lion's Gate, okay? And then we're gonna walk inside of the Muslim Quarter. So just to understand that that's where we are, okay? Uh, Lion's Gate, like pretty much all the gates, uh, has a lot of names, okay? It's called Lion's Gate. It's called St. Stephen's Gate because there was uh, one of the early Christian martyrs, uh, a soldier named Stephen uh, and or Etienne in French, right? And, the, and uh, it seems that this was the place or this was the place that the Christians believed that he was martyred for his faith. Really, it probably was closer to Damascus Gate. Um, it has the name of uh, the Binyamin Sha'ar Sha Sha Binyamin, Sha'ar Yericho, Sha'ar Yehoshaphat. We have many names. Most people know it as the Lion's Gate. Why? Because we have these nice lions, these nice kitty cats that are right on either side, two on one side of the gate, two on the other side of the gate. If you look at them up close, you can see that they are really not lions, they're leopards. And if you know a little bit about different places in the land of Israel, these leopards might look familiar to you. We have them on a bridge near the town of Lud. We have them on a, a castle all the way up in the north, Nimrod's castle. The thing that all these places have in common is that they were built by or during the time of a fellow named Baibars. Hey, Baibars is the Mamluk conqueror. He's the guy who gets rid of the Crusaders in the 1260s. Baibars, the name itself means a panther, and this is his insignia. Okay, now a lot of people tell the story about Lion's Gate, that the lions are there, and we know better, we know they're, they're panthers or leopards. Okay, I know they're not all the same, but uh, for our purposes, they will be. Um, and um, People tell the story that Suleiman, Sultan Suleiman, the Ottoman Sultan, rebuilds the walls of Jerusalem because he has a dream where lions are going to attack him if he doesn't rebuild the walls. And that's why he puts the lions there. It's a very nice story. It's not really true. Okay. Uh, somebody else was talking about secondary use. This was probably the wall was built by Sultan Suleiman, but he finds these stones that have Baibar's emblem on them, were they used for something else, a different building, we don't really know, but he puts them into his wall, okay? The most famous thing about Lion's Gate, uh, of course, is the Six-Day War uh, and the paratroopers coming through Lion's Gate, coming down from the Mount of Olives, uh, entering through Lion's Gate and going from there kind of taking uh, a sharp left and going up onto the Temple Mount. And that's, of course, where we have the famous uh, story of Rav Gorin and blowing the shofar and saying Kaddish, right, and going up there. And only afterwards do they go down to the Western Wall. But first they come to the Lion's Gate and they go up on the Temple Mount. If you want to hear, if you haven't yet heard 
that's amazing play-by-play -play radio announcer uh, who runs with Rav Goren as their and Rav Goren comes with his chauffeur. He commandeers an army jeep and he runs with his chauffeur and a safer Torah and he comes into the city just as the soldiers are coming, the paratroopers are coming in. He wants to be there on the front lines and this army radio guy is running behind him with his microphone and a guy behind him connected to him by a cord with a tape recorder narrating as he goes. And that's why we have this amazing recording of Rav Goren and, and saying the Sheikh Yanu and saying Kaddish is unbelievable. Hey, after the fighters go into the gate a few hours later, we have this threesome who comes through the gate, Uzi Narkis, who's the uh, the general, who's the commander of Central Command, Pikud Merkaz, Moshe Dayan, of course, in the middle. Everybody recognizes him, and Yitzchak Rabin, who was the uh, who was the Ramatkal, who was the chief of staff, right? Moshe Dayan's a defense minister, uh, and uh, Rabin was the chief of the whole army, and they're coming in through Lions Gate. Okay, let's go back in a time machine to first temple times. Okay, we want to talk about water because we said water is very important for this time period. So if you look at this map here, okay, so the city at its largest in first temple times, right, comes around the temple mount, comes over to here, more or less in the Jewish quarter and comes out towards the area of today's Jaffa Gate and goes down towards the city of David. This whole northern area, all of this that we are calling the Muslim Quarter, right? This is today's old city walls. All of this is outside the city, okay? And as you can see in the map here, you have tombs, you have tombs, you have tombs outside, right? Because we bury outside the city, but you also have a pool. Because remember, we said topographically, we have this nice Beit Zeta Valley, water draining into a pool here. You have pool. You have a pool down in the city of David, right? You have the Shiloh pool, but that's not enough water. We need more water. Um, in, um, in the description in Malachim, and also we hear about it in Yeshayahu, but in Malachim Bet, we hear about the Assyrian king who comes to the city uh, and he sends an emissary, he sends, sorry, um, right, the Rav Shaker, the general comes uh, and his soldiers, Vayavo Yerushalayim, Vayavo, Vayalu, Vayavo, Vayamdu, Bitalat Habrecha Ha'elyona, Asher B'misilat Sdei Kovis. Okay, they come to the channel of the upper pool by the launderer's field, right? Which makes sense. If you're going to do your laundry, you want to go where there's water. So you go to this pool. So this is where the Assyrians come. And remember, we say attackers are always coming from the north. So this is a first temple period pool that we hear about in our sources. We don't find it only because in the same place later, other people are going to build pools, right? Pools are going to be uh, important in other places. So in Second Temple times, you already have another pool here, and this is called Birket Israel. Now, if you look at this picture, you'll say, oh, I've walked around that area. I've never seen anything that looks like this. That's because today this has been turned into a parking lot, which is strange to imagine, but that's what it is. It was this very large pool, which is near the Lion's Gate of today. You literally walk in from Lion's Gate, and it's on your left, and it's a major parking area. You can just stand there for hours and watch people try to get in and out of there with their cars. It's it's kind of insane. Um, but it's a major area for Muslim, for Arabs who live in the Muslim quarter. It's an access. It's a gate onto the Temple Mount. Okay? But it used to be a huge pool. It was enormous, 110 by 40 meters, 80 meters deep. Very, very important in Second Temple times. Eventually, it stops being used as a pool. It's filled up with garbage because it's very deep, right? So you're going to throw your garbage in there. The British clean it up and it's turned into a parking lot. Today, this is uh, this is next to what's called the Gate of the Tribes, Shar Hashvatim, that goes onto the Temple Mount. Not an access point for non-Muslims, but this is where the paratroopers come in in 1967, okay? So this is, again, that water collection story. So we had our Brecha El Yonah in first temple times. Second temple times, we have this pool, and we're going to see that we have two other pools, okay? So somebody was asking about the water collection. 
and the and the temple of healing that brings us to our next site inside of lion gate okay and this is the area of what's called saint anne's okay saint anne's today is an enormous crusader church you're seeing over here uh today it is run by uh, a french order of monks called the white fathers okay uh as we're going to see it was built as a Byzantine church, then it was a crusader church, then the Muslims took it over and turned it into a madrasa, right, a, a Muslim uh, school. And then the Ottomans gave it to France, right, the Ottomans, with the Crimean War in the 19th century, the European powers, some of the European powers, helped the Ottomans, and in return, they have to do all kinds of things for them giving their European citizens in the land of Israel more rights and also giving some presents. So they uh, they asked the British what they want. The British wanted Cyprus. They got Cyprus as a present. They asked the French what they want. The French wanted St. Anne's. You could say, really? You didn't want a whole island? But they didn't. They wanted St. Anne's. That's what they got. Now, what is this area? Well, first of all, this is just the back and forth that I said, right? Uh, in Crusader times the church, Mamluks take it over and over the church, right? It's the exact same building, this very impressive crusader, clearly church building. Uh, and they write an Arabic inscription. This is uh, giving it to, uh, this is making it into a madrasa, um, making it into a, uh, a study hall. But what's inside, right? So if you come here, you see the church, but if you walk past the church, you get to a very large archaeological excavation that is not really visited so much by people and it's not super taken care of, but it's actually very important. And this is from Second Temple Times. So what do we have here? Okay, you'll see a drawing of it. It'll make more sense, but it's it's interesting to just see the the archaeology of it first. There are two pools that are here, a north pool and a south pool, um, with four stoas kind of like uh enclosures we'll see it in a minute okay it's already here in Hasmonean times it's called the sheep's pool or brechot hatzon in the new testament uh in hebrew but in the new testament it's called beit chista or the bethesda pools that's what christians call it okay but in jewish sources it's called the sheep pools okay mostly you can see part of the southern pool all right that's over here but what is this place? So take a look. This is a reconstruction of it in the model that's in the Israel Museum of uh, Jerusalem in Second Temple times. So you can see that it's got one nice pool here, one nice pool here, right, with these stoas all around and a division in the middle, right, dividing it into two separate pools, okay? And this is where you can see some of the pools even today, okay? Um, what did they use this for, right? Is it a mikvah? Is it something else? All right, so we have, uh, pools are obviously very important. We need a water supply for Jerusalem. Remember, this is Second Temple times. You have many people who are living in the city. You have many more people who are visiting the city, right? You need a water supply for the mikdash, for the temple. We're very close to the temple mount here. You need a water supply for the visitors. You need mikvahot, right? You need ritual baths for people. But we also have a tradition both from Second Temple times and later, that these pools were used for healing, right? And that's where we get to a very interesting story and the reason why you have churches here, okay? So in the book of John, we have a story about Jesus. Now, we have lots of stories like this that take place in different places where Jesus heals people, right? This is taking off on stories from the Tanakh, where you have Eliyahu healing people, where you have Elisha healing people. Jesus is coming and he's healing people. Usually he's getting in trouble for healing the people because he sometimes does it on Shabbos, right? Things like that. But we are interested in the healing story and not in the repercussions of it. Okay, so in the book of John, chapter five, sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. There is in Jerusalem near the sheep's gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, Beit Chista, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades, right? That's what we saw before. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed, right? Why did they come here? 
because they believed that the waters would heal them. One who had been there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred while I'm trying to get in. Someone else goes down ahead of me, right? You can picture this Nebuch guy. He tries to go in. And all these Jews are shoving him out of the way. You can't go in. I want to go in. So what does Jesus do? He doesn't help him into the pool. He says to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured, he picked up his mat and walked. Now that's very interesting, right? Uh, leave aside the theology. We don't care so much about the Christian theology. What's interesting is that Jesus doesn't want to have anything to do with this pool, right? The pool is not what's healing you. I'm healing you, i.e. God is healing you, right? So is this some kind of a polemic against this idea of a healing pool, which is not necessarily a Jewish idea. It's more of a pagan idea interesting. Who knows, right? That seems to be what's going on, the subtext of the story here. Um, we know that after the Mikdash is destroyed, after the city becomes a Roman city, this area becomes a temple for a god a god known as Asclepius, who's the god of healing. Okay? We have this in lots of places in the Roman world. Okay? This is a healing pool, and people come here to be healed. Are they coming because of the story in the New Testament? Are they coming because this is a much older tradition? How does this fit into Jewish ideas of healing? All very, very interesting questions. By Byzantine times, right, the city is now a Christian city. There is a chapel that is literally built over the pools, right? And see these nice arches. We saw them in the picture here, okay? These are the, the foundations for this church, Okay, so the church is built, the pool, it seems, this is a drawing of what we think it looked like in Byzantine times, the pools are still there, okay, they're still important. Um, later on, the crusaders come and they build a different church. This has already become more of a, a ruin and they build a church here. Okay, so let's just review in terms of water sources, because that's what's going to be important to us here. Um, so water sources in Second Temple times, okay? So we've got these pools by St. Anne that we just talked about. We've got the Birket Brechat Yisrael across the way. Two very important water sources, very large, very close to the Second Temple, very close to the Mikdash. We have another pool that we're going to come to a little further down the street called the Strathian Pool, much smaller, built by Herod, but also important. These are not the only pools in the city. We also have pools that are closer to the west side of the city, right? Chizkiyahu's pool, another smaller one, the pool of Mamila outside the city. The, of course, the Shiloach down in the city of David. Lots of water sources besides, of course, cisterns that people have. Water, very, very significant. We're going to come back to it, but that's just to kind of round up all of these uh, these different sources that we have. And of course, the ones over here, like we said, are fed by this whatever might have been there, built there, an aqueduct, a channel, bringing water from this north-south valley. Okay, so far so good. I hope so. Okay, um, let's switch our, our emphasis for a minute. In the north of the city, you had Jewish life, okay? There's an area in the, the Northeast that's called Babchuta. Um, and uh, in the early Muslim period, we know that the Jews who had used to live by the Southern Wall, okay? When the Muslims first allow the Jews to come back after they've been thrown out of the city by the Romans, by the Christians, they're allowed to come back uh, under the, uh, the edict of the, of the commander Omar, right? Omar allows them back in the city. It seems they live in the south, right? They live in the south near the southern excavations, near the Dung Gate. But uh, at a certain point, uh, about a thousand years ago, the Ayyubids, the Muslim uh, rulers at the time, rebuild the wall of the city. And in order to rebuild the wall of the city, they kick the Jews out and the Jews move north. And this is in the 11th century. And this is what we were talking about when we said that the Jews are the first line of defense against the Crusaders, because this is where they're living. Okay? Um, later, Jews don't live here. They move. They they come after the Crusaders and they move back into what we call the Jewish Quarter and they live in the Jewish Quarter. But in the 19th century, the Jewish Quarter is becoming very overcrowded. Before they start to move outside of the walls, they expand into the Muslim Quarter. Okay, we're going to talk about this a little later. Okay, mostly into the area 
to the west, closer to the Jewish quarter, but they also expand to this area of Babchuta in the east, okay? Um, but it's not very popular. It's far from the Jewish quarter. It's not so convenient. There's tensions with the Arabs. And in 1929, when there are Arab riots all over the country, and particularly in Jerusalem and in Spad and in Hebron, of course, um, the Jews leave this area completely. They abandon it, except for this lady. Okay, her name is Rachel Green, uh, and she's she's known as Rachel Imenu, even by the Arabs, Mother Rachel. Uh, and she says, I'm not leaving. I want there to be a Jewish presence here. And she stays on here and she's respected by the Arabs. They don't attack her and she stays here, but she stays here by herself, basically. Uh, and she died in 1934, but she keeps up her, the Jewish presence in the north of the city. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about the Via Dolorosa. Very, very important for Christians, right? It's a very experiential idea that you walk in the footsteps of Jesus on the route of the crucifixion. Today, if you come on Fridays, or certainly if you come during Holy Week before Easter, you will see hundreds, probably thousands of Christians, some of them carrying huge crosses, walking and stopping at the 14 stations of the cross, and they read from the New Testament, and they pray, and they, each part is something significant, right? And you see it, and you say, oh, this must be a very old tradition. It is a very old tradition, but not in the same places, okay? Uh, in different times, the Via Dolorosa, the Way of Sorrows, okay, is different. In Byzantine times, it actually starts up on the Mount of Olives, and it goes down into uh, the valley, into Gethsemane, and then it goes through Lion's Gate, and it goes to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, but it doesn't have any stops on the Via Dolorosa of today. In the 8th century, it starts out below Harazetim, it goes to Hartzion, right, to Mount Zion, then it goes to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. In the 14th century, it goes opposite to what it is today. It starts in the church and it ends up on today's Via Dolorosa. Okay? Uh, today, it starts out near Lion's Gate and it goes and it finishes in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. The idea that the root is following the judgment of Jesus, his sentencing, things that happened to him along the way is carrying the cross, the crucifixion, and the burial. Um, where did these things really happen? Probably not along the Via Dolorosa of today. Probably the governor's palace where the trial takes place is by Jaffa Gate, right? In the excavations that were done in Herod's palace in the Tower of David, we think that was the Roman governor's palace. And probably the route is actually really very short from Jaffa Gate to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. But that doesn't mean that people do not follow this route today. Uh, and as you can see, right, there are these signs, right? Here's a Roman numeral three or on the wall here, also three ST station along the way, all of the different stations. Um, in the Byzantine city, this is a very big deal to do these processions. It's very experiential. The city has grown. Okay, you have a, a, um, a triumphal arch over here, and you have the gate, right? This should be looking familiar to us, but you have churches along the way here. You have the churches of St. Anne, the Church of St. Anne that we talked about. We have churches over here. We have the Holy Sepulchre. You have this huge cardo. You have a lot of parades and a lot of processionals, right, that are going on that people are using to experience this story, okay? Um, along the Via Dolorosa of today, the route begins near two Franciscan churches, uh, the condemnation and the flagellation. It includes the area of this pavement, this lithostratos, this street that the Christians believe was in the street in the time of Jesus's time. We now know it was later. It was from the time of Hadrian. Um, the Franciscans, this is where we get to something interesting, right? The Franciscans call themselves the Custodia Terra Sancta. We talked about this and we talked about the Christian quarter, the custodians of the Holy Land. They not only preserve their holy places, but many of them were scholars and archaeologists. Uh, and today they have, by the two churches, they have a building that's actually a, a very cool museum um, that shows, first of all, the building itself has pieces from crusader times byzantine times roman times okay um and the museum shows finds from franciscan excavations from herodian from uh, harnevo from other places the exhibit is mostly about 
everyday life in Second Temple times, meaning we say Second Temple times, they're saying everyday life in, in Jesus's times, uh, but same time period. And the idea is to understand what life was like. So they have coins, they have weights, they have lamps, they have dishes, right? Uh, burial, ossuaries, all different kinds of stuff. Very, very interesting, very beautifully done. Not big, but interesting. Uh, the curator is Father Eugenio Aliat Aliatu, who is an Italian Franciscan monk who knows an awful lot about archaeology. It's a very interesting place to visit. Uh, across the street, this is right by the exit from the Kotel tunnels, if people remember going there, uh, there's a school called the Omaria School. Uh, you can go up the steps and you have an amazing view directly onto Harabait. Okay? But also very important, this is the site of the Antonia Fortress, right? We said Herod builds this fortress in order to protect Harabite when Titus enters the city uh, and attacks the city. He captures the Antonia Fortress, and it's from the Antonia Fortress that he attacks the temple and destroys it. So Antonia Fortress is very important, but there's nothing left of it today. Okay? But this is the site of it, this school today, this elementary school called the Omaria School. If you look at the picture on the left, this is a photograph, a class meeting, right? 1929 meeting of Arab leaders uh, where they basically decided to carry out the riots against the Jews in 1929. So this is not exactly a very uh, happy place for us, but important to remember. Um, and across the way from there is a, a, a convent called the Sisters of Zion, okay? Who are the Sisters of Zion? Sisters of Zion are part of an order uh, founded by a Jewish convert to Christianity, a French Jew whose name was Alphonse Ratispon. Uh, and he founded an order of monks and nuns, which I guess because people like to be with people who are like them, uh, attracted many Jews who converted to Christianity. So it was a lot of the, the monks and the nuns were formerly Jews. Well, they're always Jews, but you know, Jews who took on Christianity. Uh, there's a Radisbon monastery in Rehavia. Uh, of which we could say good things. They took in the mothers and the children of Kfar Zion, uh in early 1948 when they had to be evacuated from Gush Etzion. Um, There's another Rasbon monastery in Ankarim. And the convent is here on the Via Dolorosa, and they're called the Sisters of Zion. Now, when they built the convent, it's, it's relatively new, right? It's from the late 19th century. And when they built it, what they discovered underneath was a street, right? A lithostratos, okay? Uh, the, the pavement, right? The street, uh, which they you could see the, the blocks, you could see the game boards that are etched into it. Um, the nuns who found it were sure that they had found the street from the time of Jesus. Uh, and they created a whole story around it, which Christians are still telling today. This is the street where the Roman soldiers stood. This is why they have these game boards here, because they were playing, uh, making fun of Jesus and playing games about him and gambling on him. Um, and, uh, and you have a marketplace here. And, and all of this is bringing to life the story of Jesus walking through the marketplace, carrying the cross. It's all very nice, except that the pavement does not date to Second Temple times. It dates to the second century okay, of the common era. This is when Hadrian conquers Jerusalem again after the Great Revolt. This is the time of the Bar Kokhba Revolt. Uh, throws Jews out of the city completely, remakes the city, uh, and builds here a marketplace, a forum. Okay? Now, we'll come back to that in a minute. But underneath this sidewalk is a pool. And this is why the story of the nuns doesn't make sense. Okay? This pool is from Second Temple times. Okay? This is called the Struthian Pool. This is a pool that was built by Herod as yet another water source. Okay? Um, if you've gone to the Kotel Tunnels, you've seen this pool at the very end, but you've only seen half a pool because there's a wall here. The other half of the pool is across the street in the Sisters of Zion convent in their basement. Why is there a wall between the two parts of the pool? Because in the 19th century, uh, Charles Warren, right, the British explorer, came and he kind of 
discovered the Kotel tunnels before they were really discovered. And he came upon this pool and he found some like old pieces of wood and he used them to like as rafts so that he didn't drown. And he got to the end and he had to get out and he managed to like crawl out and he found himself in the middle of the convent. <laughs> And the nuns were none too pleased about that. So they built a wall that made sure that nobody else could get in. But it's really one pool with a wall in the middle. Okay, so now let's try to make sense. All right, we'll come back to this in a minute. I want to make sense of what we're seeing here. Um, okay, so we have a lot of pieces. So stay with me. It's complicated. Um, in the time of the Hashmonaim, right? Second century before the common era, you had an aqueduct that brought water directly to the Temple Mount, okay? When Herod comes along a generation or two later, he says, I don't need an aqueduct. I have my own aqueducts. And he makes a pool. This is what we call the Struthium pool. He has aqueducts in other places. Here he makes a pool doesn't have an aqueduct that brings water onto the Temple Mount, this is erased, okay? Great revolt, the Romans conquer the city, they destroy the temple, 70 years passes, we have the Bar Kokhba revolt in the 130s, okay? And with the Bar Kokhba revolt, the Jews are kicked out of Jerusalem for the next 500 years, okay? Hadrian the emperor comes in, changes a lot of things in the city, and he gets rid of the pool. He doesn't get rid of it. The pool stays behind, but he builds a sidewalk on top of it, right? And that's this forum, Lithostratos. He builds a big marketplace. All these other things are underneath. This is what the nuns have discovered, okay? And then he builds another one of these triumphal arches. Do we have anything left from that? Yes, we do. Okay, and for that, we have to go back to this. Okay, this is called the Eke Homo Arch. It looks like this today. You would never notice it if you didn't know to look for it. It looks like a piece of an arch on the street in the old city. But really, we have old pictures that date back to the late 19th century that show us that this is only one piece of a whole triple arch. We have this, which is today incorporated into one of the buildings. You can't see it anymore today, okay? But this is part of this triumphal arch, another one, not the one that we had at Shar Shrem, but another one. And it's part of Hadrian's rebuilding of this whole area, sidewalk, forum, arches, right? And this is his way of saying, this is my city now, and I will say where the markets are, and everything's going to look different, okay? I hope that wasn't too confusing. All right, we will finish with two last things. Uh, if you keep walking along the Via Dolorosa until you get to the corner, you get to this very fancy building. Uh, if you go inside, it's, it's really a beautiful building, very Christian, as you can see. Um, you can go up on the roof and have a, an amazing view, one of the many amazing views that you have in the Muslim Quarter. This is called the Austrian Hospice. It was built in 1863, right? Uh, 19th century, we have European powers. Everybody wants to build something here. Um, so this is the Austrian contribution. Uh, Emperor Franz Josef stays here. In World War II, this is taken over by the British and it becomes an internment camp for uh, for Axis soldiers who are captured. Uh, in 1948, it's a British military hospital, then the Jordanians use it. In 1985, it's returned to the Austrians, it's renovated and it's been reopened as a guest house and restored to its former glory. So interesting place to visit. Uh, and finally, a little bit about Jewish life in the Muslim quarter, okay? In the late 19th, early 20th century, uh, the Jews are completely overcrowded in the Jewish quarter. There is not enough space for them. There's a beginning of movement outside the walls, right? We know about the first neighborhoods outside the walls, but there's also some movement inside the walls. And the Jews expand to the western part of the Muslim quarter because that's the closest to the Jewish quarter. Um, and we have all kinds of things. We have Batei Knesset, like the Hungarian Ohel Yitzchak Batei Knesset. We have have a printing press from the back family. We have a lot of yeshivot. We have banks. We have guest houses. We have stores in the shuk. And we have this huge building called Beit Wittenberg, okay, uh, which had homes, which had a synagogue. Okay? It, was, uh, it was a very, very important building. What happened to all of this stuff, right? At, at one point, about half of the Muslim quarter, a third of the Muslim quarter was Jewish. What happened is 1929. Okay? The 1929 riots, first of all, 
even before that, more and more neighborhoods built outside the walls. Why would you live in a cramped little area of the Muslim quarter when you could have more space and more hygiene outside the walls? But more importantly, in 1929, terrible riots and the Jews retreat back into the Jewish quarter. Uh, and this area becomes empty of Jews. That starts to change in the 80s and in the 90s with Aterek Khanim and most famously with Ariel Sharon, who bought an apartment in Beit Wittenberg, right? Aterek Khanim bought the whole building. Ariel Sharon bought an apartment, and there's this huge, I don't know if he ever went there, but he bought it, and this huge menorah on the roof. So this is like deep in the, in the, you know, the center of the Muslim quarter but it has uh, very much a Jewish presence. So that's just an interesting uh, modern note. All right, let's see what questions we did not answer yet. Questions, all right. Uh, water, any marshlands and mosquitoes? We hear about that in other places, not so much here, because it clearly was used, it was drained. Um, what's the black thing over the street sign? I explained that, right? That's the that's the third station. Beit Chista, probably something like Chesed, right? Exactly, as Susanna writes here. Um, and why is it Chesed? Maybe Chesed because of the water? I'm not sure, right? Uh, shame? I don't think so, but I don't know. Um, when the Jews began moving into the Muslim quarter, did they mostly own or rent? So they did buy certain properties. So for example, if you go into the Ohel Yitzchak synagogue today, which is the one that is directly north of the Kotel, right? If you go past the security that takes you into the Kotel, if you're coming from the north, uh, you have a staircase on the right, you go up, there's this Ohel Yitzchak synagogue, which has been renewed and restored by um, Irving Moskowitz. It's beautiful, right? And inside, there's a sign on the wall that says, says that Irving Moskowitz bought the shul from the Hungarian Kolel, meaning they owned it, um, with the stipulation that when Mashiach comes, the Hungarian Kolel would like the property back because it's right near Harabait. So there were places that were definitely bought by Jews uh, and rebought, reclaimed by Atera Khanim today, um, and some were rented as well. Okay. Um, we, I'm sorry again for the back and forth. We do not have class next week. We do have class the week after. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Sharon had an apartment in the courtyard of the hotel where Mark Twain stayed when he visited. Is that Bate Wittenberg? I don't know. I, I didn't know that. I didn't know about the Mark Twain part, but that's kind of neat. So if you have more information, Asher, please tell us. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. See you in two weeks, God willing. Shabbat Thank Shalom. You. Thank you. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you very much. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you, Julie. Bye bye.